Can I tell you, last week, Thursday, I uh, went to the hospital and had an MRI. How many of you here have had an MRI? Yes, yes, yes. You can identify with me, right? Those of you who have not yet had an MRI, I hope you never have to have one. It's, uh, it's where you go into this tunnel. It's a huge machine, and it's for x-rays. You enter this tunnel, and it's a tiny little hole, and believe it or not, it's, it's to take a 3D picture of your entire body. You're not allowed to move when you're inside, okay? And so the experience is, is something I've heard about, but now here I am with my hands on my sides, lying down and being pushed into this tunnel, and you feel like you're going into a coffin. <laughs> I've never been inside a coffin before, but I, I can imagine what it feels like because you open your eyes inside that tunnel, and it's like five inches between your face and the, and the machine all around you, solid machine. It's, it's, it's mind-boggling, but you've got to really condition your mind to be able to go through this. It's not easy. They give you a a button that you can press. It's called a panic button. If ever you just can't take it anymore, you just press the button and they will come and and be able to get you out of there after maybe five minutes. (laughs) Can you imagine? So you're you're panicking inside, you know? And the guy tells you, oh, just rest. It's 20 minutes, not 20 minutes long. Just rest. And I say, rest and take a nap. Are you kidding me? You sit, you're lying down there, the sound of like a jackhammer going on in the back of your butt. It's loud. You can't rest. And so as I'm in that room, I feel, I feel so enclosed in that little tunnel, and I start to pray. And let me tell you, instead of panicking, you pray, and it makes a world of a difference. And that's what gets me through every day. I realize life is, is like that. Many times you're stuck. You're restrained. You're constrained. You're restricted. You're hemmed in. You're bound. You, you're stuck, and you're, you're, you know, you're confined. The solution instead of pressing the panic button, is to pray. Because God's there to help you and give you that peace that you need. Well, friends, I've often said that when my car starts making noise, it's time to bring it to the mechanic, right? When your computer starts to act up, what do you do? You go to the IT specialist, right, the technician. When your body starts to ache and you feel some pains, you go right away to the the doctor, and find out what's happening. And by the way, the results of the MRI, as you can see, I'm still standing. But the doctor says, uh, Mr. Soriano, you're getting old. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, he's, you're getting old. And the truth is, yes. He says, you need to be more careful. Be careful and exercise more and, and you know, take care of your body. And so that's, that's the good news. Uh, so when your body is, is aching, aching with pain, you go to the doctor. Why is it? That when people today have no peace of mind, they're filled with sadness and depression, they have a broken marriage, why is it that they don't realize that 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 is a spiritual symptom that they need to seek help for their souls? Think about that. Why don't people go for help for their souls? Because Jesus, He said, come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. See, friends, the Lord today wants to give you a full life. He wants to offer you an abundant life of overflowing blessings. Jesus himself says, I came that you might have what? Life and have it abundantly. That's his desire. Friends, understand that all of us who do not, who have not accepted Jesus Christ, those who are not filled with the Spirit today, those who are church shopping You know what I mean? Church shopping instead of church serving. Those who feel that there's no help or there's no rest, there's no hope, it's not too late. It's not too late. God is looking for you today. And God has brought you here because He wants to tell you about Him. Jesus has an appointment with you just like He had an appointment with the woman at the well. He wants to speak to you. He wants you to know that you can have a full life, a meaningful life. Last week, what was the topic of our message? What was the title? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Today, we're going to do part two of that message. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, if you were not here last week, you can read the summary of that message here in the Chronicle, okay? Don't read it now, but get to know what that's all about. And let me, let me just say something in addition to that. If for some reason you just throw this away at the end of the day, 
or you just file it and never see it again, can I encourage you? Give it to someone else. Give it to someone and let them read it. Put it in a restaurant, put it in, a, in an office, wherever. I've heard lots of great stories where people just pick this up from out of nowhere and they start reading it and then they come here to Sunday service. It's, it's amazing. So do that with your chronicles. Use it in a, in a great way, okay? So the title of our message today is Be Filled with the Holy Spirit, Part 2. We're going to focus on hunger and thirst for righteousness. Let's all say that together. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. What's another word for righteousness? Tell me, what's another word? When you hear righteousness, it sounds so spiritual. Eh? So righteousness is holiness, yes? Right living. What else? Blameless, blamelessness, godliness. Ano pa? Righteousness, Christ-likeness, yes. Two simple points today. We must, you and I must hunger for Christ-likeness. And point number two, we must thirst for Christ-likeness. And I'll explain what all this means. It comes from the Sermon on the Mount, which you're all familiar with, right? Jesus declaring to the people in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Everyone, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. The word blessed there is happy or joyful. It's like God's hand of favor is upon them, blessed. These people are blessed. Who are blessed? Those who what? Hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be satisfied. Friends, today the world offers so many things to fill the emptiness in people's hearts. And the world is so good at offering you things like success, pride, position, power, money, sex, pleasure, and all those things, including sin. But can I tell you something? The only thing that can fill our spiritual hearts is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Why do I say that? Because only Jesus can provide you with forgiveness. Forgiveness for the sins that haunt you. Only Jesus can provide you an abundant life with God. Only Jesus can give you eternal life to set you free from all the fear of death. Only Jesus. Friends, that, my friends, is why we are here today. Ask yourself, why, why do you come here? And why do you spend an hour and a half in this place when you can go to another church and, and be over in 30 minutes? Why? Why are you here today? Is it because you're searching for answers to your problems? Is it because you want to know God more? Is it because you want to grow in your relationship with Him? Is it because you want to learn how to make a difference in life? Why are you here? Could it be that Maybe you're dragged here by your wife or your parents and, and you're just here because of that. Don't answer that question, okay? Last Sunday, we heard a very important message on be filled with the Spirit. Just one question. Why is that important? Why is that important? Just a reminder, the reason that's so important is because you and I, as Christians, we are, correct me if I'm wrong, the Christian life is not hard. It is what? Impossible. Do you agree? The Christian life is not difficult. It is supernatural. You have to live it in the supernatural. That's why today you've got so many religions. Some religions teach if people don't believe the same thing you do, you kill them. Some religions teach that. But Jesus is so unique. Jesus teaches us, love your enemies. Do good, and do good to those who persecute you. Imagine that. That's, that's impossible. How can you humanly, humanly speak, how can you do that? Love your enemies? And yet the uniqueness of Jesus is that He just doesn't tell you, this is how you behave. I mean, all the religions tell us that. This is how you behave. No, He goes one step further. He says, I will tell you how to overcome, and I will enable you to overcome. So God is, is wonderful. He not only tells us, these are my standards, and His standards are very high. He says, these are not my, just my standards. I will give you the power to overcome that. I will give you the power to sustain 
and to be able to accomplish and to fulfill this life. His standards are so high. I mean, let me tell you, young men, listen to this. When, when Jesus says, if a man lusts after a woman, it's considered what? Adultery. High standard. If a man gets angry and curses his brother, that's considered murder. Look at that. He gives us those high standards, and yet He doesn't leave us alone. He enables us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why it's so important to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, you and I would be lost. So what does it really mean, and how do we put it into practice? Because you can learn these things in your mind, but how do you actually live it out in your life? What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Simple definition, okay? It means to dwell in God's Word, to richly dwell in God's Word, to make God's Word a part of your life, to, to read it, to meditate on it, to, to know it, to live by its directions. That's what it means. When you are filled with God's Word in your life, you're walking in the Spirit. That guides you, okay? Not only that, it's to be controlled by God. To be filled with the Spirit is to be controlled by God, controlled by the Holy Spirit. It's where you surrender control. You don't say, how much of the Holy Spirit do I have? No, it's how much does the Holy Spirit have of me? As we abide in Christ, we're surrendering our will to His. Are you with me? The command, be filled with the Holy Spirit, is in the present continuous tense, meaning you need to be filled today, tomorrow. You can never say, okay, I'm filled. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. That's it. Done. Job complete. No, no, no. It's every day, moment by moment. That's the command. You need to be filled every moment of your life. And what's amazing is that God enables us. He equips us. He allows us to overcome the difficulties of daily life. So, how do you do this? Let me put this into practical ways. Number one, we must hunger for Christ-likeness. What does that mean to hunger? To hunger for Christ is to yearn for Him, to long for Him, to desire God in our lives. You must realize that you need the Lord over all things in life. You need Him to completely control your life. If you don't have the desire or hunger for God, you're going to have a hard time. It's useless. So, do you have an appetite for God today? Do you have a hunger for God today? Or do you have a hunger for money? Do you have a hunger for sex? Do you have a hunger for alcohol? Do you have a hunger for, for self-pleasure? Do you have a hunger for, for success and pride and all of that? Friends, I suggest that you and I, we hunger for God because He is the treasure he is the treasure, and that when you have that encounter with God, all things, everything else will be far secondary. Hunger for God. I want to ask you some questions, and these questions will reveal to us and to you if you have a spiritual hunger for God, okay? Simple questions, yes or no. Just answer yes or no. It's just for you to know. You don't not ask, answer out loud, just for you to know. Answer these questions. Number one, today. Are you satisfied with your relationship with God? Are you satisfied with your relationship with God? Number two, do you find yourself content in where you are in your spiritual journey? Do you find yourself content in where you are in your spiritual journey? And number three, do you have peace in your life in spite of constantly displeasing God? Do you have peace in your life despite constantly displeasing God? You know your answers? Now, if you answered no to all those questions, you have a spiritual hunger. Praise God. You have a spiritual hunger. Let me ask you some more questions. Do you desire to read the Bible? Do you desire to read the Bible? Does it bother you that you don't? Do you feel inadequate when people are talking about the Word of God and you want to contribute something and yet you can't because you don't have enough knowledge? Do you feel inadequate those times? Friends, if you answered yes to all of those questions, then yes, you have a spiritual hunger for God. David, in Psalm 27 verse 4, look what he says. 
he says right away, he says, the one thing I desired of the Lord, everyone, that I will seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. The one thing that David wanted the most out of all things was the Lord. He said, I seek him. I want to live in his temple. I want to be with him. That was David's sole desire over all things. You know the people I worry about? The people I worry about are those who don't pick up their Bible year after year, and they don't even worry about it. They don't care. If you don't have this holy unrest in your heart, then you don't have spiritual hunger. But it doesn't mean you're disqualified, okay? There is hope. You have to listen carefully. One of the problems that we have is that we think spiritual hunger is the same as physical hunger. But did you realize they're completely different, completely opposite? Now, today, right now, how many of you are hungry? I mean, lunchtime, how many of you are hungry? Yes, 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 you're hungry, okay? If you could eat something, what would you eat? What are you craving for? So you tell your neighbor, what, what are you planning to have for lunch? Go ahead, tell your neighbor. Where are you going? Where, what are you going to plan to eat? Huh? Yes, I heard pizza. I heard hamburger, patatim, yes. Chicken joy, yes, what else? Huh? Dinner go and... Yes, I will join you later on, okay? I will join you. All right. Now, friends, when a person is hungry physically, they're hungry, and they haven't eaten for a long time, and then they sit down and they start eating, they, after consuming their food, they go away satisfied. Yes or no? Yes. After you eat, you go away satisfied. That's, that's what's true for normal people. But that's the exact opposite in the spiritual realm. Because in the spiritual realm, a person that does not eat spiritually, the more he doesn't eat, the more he loses his appetite. And the more he loses his appetite, the more he loses his desire to spend time with God. Are you with me? Have you ever thought about that? That's why people can come in Christianity at a certain level, and then they can start to just coast along. You know, coast along in Tagalog, pabanjing banjing. They just coast along. No matter what's happening in their life, you know, they go on for months and years without ever getting back into God's Word. And they have no desire to come back because spiritually, they've lost it. There's no more desire for God's Word. You see, in the physical realm, exact, it's exactly the opposite as the spiritual realm. When a person eats physically, they are satisfied. When a spiritual person eats food, the Word of God, what happens to him? He gets hungrier. He gets hungrier and hungrier, and he cannot satisfy that appetite, that desire, that expectation. And that's what it's like with spiritual hunger compared to physical hunger. Do you understand that? The more you eat in the spiritual realm, the more you get into the Word of God, and the more you want to love God. It's just that works that way. The more you get into the things of the Lord, the more you want to get into the things of the Lord. You cannot meet the expectations of your spiritual hunger. It's just not enough because you're reading God's Word. And once you begin to feed on God's Word, it develops, develops this feeding of, of I, wanna, I want more. In Psalm, 20, in Psalm 42, it talks about the deer. It says, as the deer pants for the brooks. These are the water brooks, the streams of water. So pants my soul for you. Oh God, my soul thirsts for the living God. It's hard to believe, but it's true. The more you get into the Word of God, the more you want the Word of God. When you come to church and you hear a message and you like it, you want to go to Bible studies. You want to go to, to small groups. You want to go home and open your Bible and read for yourself. That's what happens. Perhaps the most difficult question to ask is, what do I do? What do I do today if I don't have that spiritual hunger that you're talking about? I don't have that desire for Christ's likeness. I don't have the desire to be filled with the Spirit. Maybe you're a Christian and you're sitting here today and you're doing everything that a Christian should do. Outwardly, everything is, is normal, just like Christians should act. But deep inside, deep inside, you're honest enough to admit to yourself, I don't have that desire to want to know God more. How do you develop 
that spiritual love, that hunger that leads to Christ-likeness, that leads to being filled with the Spirit. You see, here's the problem. The problem is that many people, many Christians are in their twilight zone. You know what I'm talking about? They're in their twilight zone. And because of that, how in the world would they ever come back? Because they have no more desire, no more, no more appetite. What will bring them back from that cycle of being so far away? Friends, here is the answer. Listen carefully, because this is something all of us could do. The answer to develop that hunger is to force feed yourself. You know what I'm talking about? It means when you don't want to, you do it anyway. You get yourself to sit in a chair. You put your feet under the desk. You put your Bible on top of the desk. You open it up and you start reading. You start reading. And if you fall asleep, you read aloud. You read to the top of your lungs. You just keep reading. And you know what, friends? As you keep reading and reading and reading, all of a sudden, I tell you what will happen. You will read something that will intersect with your spirit. And the fire that's been low down below will start coming aflame. It'll come aflame. And all of a sudden, you'll realize what you've been missing. The Word of God will come alive. And your spirit, your hunger will be revived. Friends, you'll begin to have an appetite, an appetite that you want to get more and more of God's Word. Now, for some of you, this might be so difficult to do. Another suggestion is you sit down with a friend, a really close friend, and you decide what are the passages we'll read together on our own separately. But then later we'll discuss each and every day and text each other and share what we've learned from those passages. Do something to force you to get into God's Word. For many of you, what's the first thing you do in the morning? First thing you do, how spiritual the man, you pray, huh? But you know, some people get their cell phones and what? They start reading their messages, reading all the stuff in their phones. Can I suggest to you, if you have your Bible in your phone, make that the first thing. If you want, there's this app called Everyday Bible. Everyday are two words, Bible. And when you press it open, it leads you to an Old Testament chapter. It leads you to a passage in the New Testament. It leads you to a, a psalm or a proverb or song of Solomon. Then there's insights. Friends, do whatever you need to do to really get into God's Word because the more you feed yourself, the quicker you'll start growing. But if you choose not to, if you choose just to stay the way you are, you're going to drift into autopilot for the next 50 years. And what's going to happen is that you're never going to go anywhere. It's so easy for you to just lock yourself into neutral and stay where you are for the rest of your life. Frankly, that's where a lot of God's sweet people are today. They're out in twilight zone. And I'm so sad to tell you that I've not met a Christian who is out there who today is fulfilled, is blessed, is happy, is joyful, is you know, overcoming their, their situations in life. No, today they're miserable. They're all miserable. Satan always tells us two lies. Two lies. The first thing he tells you is, it's not going to happen to you. Don't worry, it's not going to happen to you. That's the first lie. The second lie he says is, when you're into it, when you're in bondage in, into that, that problem already, the second problem he'll, the lie he'll say is, there's nothing you can do about it. Can you imagine that? There's nothing you can do about it. Friends, wherever you are in this whole matter of hungering for God, you can change. You can move on. Don't listen to those lies. When you begin to hunger for God, God will put a spirit of joy in your heart that you will just have this delight and this indescribable joy of wanting to get to know Him better and better each day. Jesus told the people after feeding the 5,000, He told them in John chapter 6, in verse 35, He says, I am the what? The bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. Friends, look at that. Jesus is saying, I just fed you. I just fed you till you're all content. But that's not what's real. What's real is the bread of life. I am. He says, I am the bread of life. He's the source of life. He says, if you come to me, 
If you come to me, you will not hunger. Why? Because he gives you the satisfaction of life. Don't be fooled by the things of this world. It's Jesus alone. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, again, remember, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. That word satisfied is the word filled. Filled to the brim and overflowing. There's no more space to put in. It's totally filled, satisfied. Satisfied with God. Friends, what does this lead to? When you are filled with the love of God, for God Himself, friends, it'll affect your love for others. And that's the byproduct of all of this in, in a way that you will be able to fulfill the greatest commandment, which is what? Love God and love others, your neighbors. Friends, to love God and to love others, that is what it is to be Spirit-filled. To love God and to love others. Understand that you cannot do this on your own. You cannot manipulate yourself to love others. You need to go to the source of love, who's God Himself. Receive that love, and then you'll be able to pass it on to others. It's been said, only the loved can love. Only the loved can love. If you understand God's love and you've received it, and you bathe in that, that unconditional embrace of God, you'll be able to pass that on to others. And that comes by hungering for God's Word, spending time in God's Word. Today we're so privileged to have sisters who are going to sing a beautiful song entitled, Oh, Wondrous Love. Please welcome Rebecca and Rachel Coates.
Friends, hunger for Christ-likeness. Love the Lord. As the song says, oh, wondrous love, you'll never let me go. Am I resting in your everlasting arms, in your faithful heart? The next point is we thirst for Christ-likeness. We must thirst for Christ-likeness. Have you guys ever been so thirsty that you felt like you're ready to pass out? Huh? Have you had that experience, you know? There's no water available and you're just you're dying of thirst. It happens. I remember I was, I was young and, and we're going hiking in, in this really hot place, dusty. The sun was so hot. We didn't have any water. We ran out of water, my friends and I, and we had to hike some more miles up this mountain. When we finally got to the destination, oh, I tell you, I grabbed a, a large glass, filled it with lots of ice and water and started drinking till, my, till I was satisfied. That was one of the, the times I remember I really thirsted so much. Do you know what? That the body, the body is composed of 80% liquid. Do you realize that? We're actually like, like blobs of fluid walking around with skin and bones. That's what we're like. Water is essential to life. A man who's depraved of water is in trouble. He's in trouble. Without water, our vital organs start to uh, shut down. Our mind starts to play tricks on us. Water is essential and critical to life. Friends, just like, just like the Holy Spirit is critical and essential to life. Today, without Him, we are powerless. We're powerless to overcome the hardships and trials that we face daily. Can I share with you a parable? It's entitled, The Parable of the Pump. Have you all heard that parable? You've heard that before, The Parable of the Pump? Have you read that in the Bible? No. Maybe because it's not in the Bible. But can I share that with you? The parable of the pump. Once there was a man who was wandering in the desert, lost for many days, and he was thirsting for water. He came to the point where every day he was getting weaker and weaker, and he was tortured for thirst. As he was crawling on the desert sand, the burning hot sun, one afternoon he saw from afar a shade of trees. He feverishly rushed forward with all his might till he finally arrived at that place. And when he got to that place, he found not an oasis of water. He didn't find a, a well springing up with bubbly water. He found a pump. Oh, who put this here? He found a pump just like this. He not only found the pump, but he also found that beside the pump were two items. Two items. And when he looked at these items, he saw that the first one was a, a jar. A jar filled with water. And he looked at the jar and he was ready to drink it. But then he said, maybe I should look at the second thing, which is a parchment note. It was an old, worn-out parchment note. And he tried to read it as best as he could. It, it said, in order for this pump to work, the jar of water must be poured inside the opening at the top of the pump so that it would be primed. You know what I'm talking about, primed? You know what that is, okay? I didn't know what that is before. When it is full, it will allow you to start pumping water. Okay. But he thought, maybe I can still pump without this, this water. So, nothing. He needs to really prime the pump. So, he kept on reading. Uh, the jar was filled with just enough water for this purpose. This note also warned the, the, the reader not to drink from the jar because every drop from this jar must be used to prime the pump. It says, once the pump is primed, an unlimited supply of sweet water will flow in abundance and be available to you. Then the parchment note's final uh, instructions were, make sure you refill the jar to the brim and leave it for the next traveler to use. Wow. So he got this note and he got this, this jar and he's thinking to himself, wow, I'm faced with a dilemma. I'm dying of thirst. I need to drink water. And, and finally, I found water. I found water. But not much, of course. If I drink this, it might not even satisfy the need for my, my thirst and, and I'll still be thirsty. But it seemed the height of foolish, foolishness. If I pour this water all down the, the top of the pump, what if the pump doesn't work? 
I'll have lost all the water I had. On the other hand, if the note was accurate, then by pouring out the small quantity of water, oh, I'd be able to have an abundance of water. Question, what should he do? What would you do? Prime the pump, drink the water. What a dilemma. You know, this parable illustrates a number of principles that we can learn from when it comes to surrender. And that involves our hearts, our minds, our hands, our feet, our bodies, everything about every aspect of our lives. In John chapter 14, verse 23, it says, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone, what? Loves me, he will what? Keep my word. And my Father, what? Will love him. And we will come to him and make our abode with him. This is such a beautiful verse. Jesus talking to the disciples, talking to us saying, if you love me, you will keep my word. Wow, that's what true love is. True love is obedience. It's keeping God's word. And then when you do that, he says, I will come to you and I'll make our board to you. We'll, we'll live with you. We'll, we'll be like you'll be like us. So let me show you the equation, okay? Love. It starts out with love, thirst. Thirst, if it's channeled right, it turns into love. Love for God, which leads to surrender, which leads to obedience, which leads to Christ-likeness. You see that? If your thirst is guided in the right direction, it'll lead to the love, love for God. And if you truly love God, you will surrender. And surrender is really obedience. And obedience will lead to Christ-likeness. God often requires us to do things that are illogical, things that don't make sense. Oftentimes, He requires you to take a step of faith, trusting simply in His Word. That's all it is. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus one afternoon and says to Jesus, he tells, asks him a very important question. It's in Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. What does he say? Teacher, what good, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? Notice that question. What good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? Question, why did you come here? What is it that you need? What are you asking of Jesus? If you're face to face with him right now, what would you ask him? Would you say, Lord, can you please uh, answer my number one prayer request? Lord, could you please help me because I'm, I'm perplexed on what to do in this decision? Would you say, Lord, you know, I'm hoping that today I can go home with something. Give me something. Or would you say, Lord, help me in this great crisis that I'm faced right now? What is it that you need? We are all filled with hopes, with dreams, with aspirations, with expectations, all of us. And we want God to answer our prayers. We want God to, to bless us right away. As a matter of fact, many times we pray, Lord, could you please answer my prayer? Could you please bless me? And could you do it by Tuesday? You know, we're like that with God. If we're honest, we oftentimes think of ourselves. It's about me. Well, Matthew chapter 19, Jesus answers the young man, the young rich ruler, and he says to him, Jesus said to him, continue, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure. Where? In heaven. And come, follow me. This verse is packed with so much truth. You see, Jesus knew exactly what that young rich ruler loved. He knew what he would not let go of. He knew what was keeping him from giving all of himself because the rich young ruler said he kept all the commandments. But Jesus was not after the money. He was after the heart of this man. He was after his heart. He wanted this man to fully surrender whatever he was holding on to because when he does, Jesus will then give him back so much that he will be filled to overflowing. Jesus says, come follow me. That's what he told the young man. Follow me and you will receive treasures in heaven. His life will change. It will be Christ-like. I believe part of the reason that God asks us to surrender is because he wants to prepare us to receive. Think about it. Only as we surrender 
do we prepare ourselves to receive? The man in this parable of the pump, think about it, he would never experience an abundance of water until he was willing to surrender that small amount that he had. Similarly, in experience, friends, the filling of the Holy Spirit, Christ's likeness will only happen in our lives if we are willing to surrender ourselves, to pour ourselves out to God and to others. The Old Testament bears witness of this. Look what it says in Psalm 126, verse 5 and 6. It says, there are those who sow in tears, continue, shall reap with joyful shouting. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. Let me explain that to you. Here's a farmer who is so seeds, but this farmer is out. It says he's sowing in tears. He's crying with joyful shouting, though. He's so unlike that rich young man, that rich young ruler who left grieving because he could not give away his possessions. This farmer is sowing his seeds, his last seeds. After this, it's over. And as he sows the seeds, he's crying. He's surrendering it. But then it says, but he will rejoice later on when he harvests sheaves of, of crops. You see, this sowing and surrendering applies to all of our lives. It applies to what you surrender as far as time, as far as money, as far as your possessions, what you surrender in terms of your love, in terms of even your sins that you're holding on to. We find that as we surrender, we are filled we're filled. Abraham willingly went to the mountain to sacrifice his son Isaac, to sacrifice him. And when God saw that Abraham was willing to surrender his son, he stopped him at just the right time. And then you hear that God blesses his life forever. But Abraham first surrendered. He did not hear the promises until he surrendered. The Apostle Paul tells us, what is our reward how do we sustain the times that we surrender? Because you're probably thinking, okay, I surrender, surrender, but what's, what's going to happen to me? What will happen? And that's your worry. How can I surrender this and this and this and this? I'll be left with nothing. Well, friends, 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says, God is able to what? To make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need will abound for every, in every good work. We don't surrender in order to get blessed, okay? Wrong motive. But the truth is, when you do surrender, you will be blessed. But that blessing is not for you. That blessing is for you to pass on to others. You know what this blessing is? When you thirst and you love and you surrender and you obey and you're christ -like, you know what the blessing is? The blessing is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. As you're filled with God's Spirit, you experience His blessings, the blessing of the fruit of love. And that brings the, the, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the faithfulness, the gentleness, and the self-control. All of that, all those fruits are yours, but they're not yours to keep. They're yours to share with others in relationships. And that's a beautiful thing because our life is all about relationships. It's meaningless if we don't have relationships. And God gives you the fruit of the Spirit as a blessing for your surrender and obedience so that you will be able to, to touch people's lives in many, many ways. Let me give you some examples. For the single mothers here, oh, you know, my heart goes out to you because I think of all the responsibilities that you're faced with, the, the, the trials of having to be a father and mother at the same time, to earn a living, to put food on the table, and you're all by yourself. Could it be that single mothers, you need to Give your children the gift of patience, the fruit of patience, as you're filled with concern over raising them without a father. The fruit of patience. Senior men, golden ladies, you know I love you. Today, maybe you're frustrated because there's so many things you want to do, but you don't have the same strength and energy to do it anymore like you did before. And you don't like burdening people to help you. And yet, your children and other people help you out of their love and, and respect for you and honor and desire to help you. Could it be that today you need to pass on the fruit of kindness, the kindness and gentleness to appreciate what they're doing? 
High school youth, is it time that you blessed your parents with faithfulness? Faithfulness that in spite of them not being over you, watching over you, as you do your schoolwork or you're with your bacadas, you are still faithful, faithful to God and faithful to your parents? The fruit of faithfulness. And you've got a lot of hardworking business people right now in this group. Hardworking business people. Can you share the fruit of self-control? Why? Because there's a lot of temptation to cheat, to cut, to, to cut corners, to do things to please yourself, to gain more. And yet, because you've got employees, co-workers, you've got bosses, you, you've got a, a relationship with God, you don't do that. You do what is right. Self-control, that, that fruit allows you to do what is right in the sight of God. Why? Because God is for you. You trust in the Lord. Self-control. Many of you here are married, married couples, and you're crying out to receive the fruit of joy. You just want that joy back in your marriage because it's been so many years that you've lost that joy. You may be sitting together today, and yet you're really not talking at home. Things are not going well. And you're, you're crying out in your hearts for a renewal of that lost, that lost affection and intimacy with each other. The fruit of joy will bring it back. And then you've got a lot of cancer patients, people who are sick, but people who keep coming here Sunday after Sunday in silent pain. And yet, the fruit that you pass on to others is the fruit of peace. And your family members watch this and they say, how can, how can you have so much peace in the midst of all this trial of your life, your sickness, the chemotherapy, the medication, the hospitalization, the doctor's fee? I mean, how do you have all this hope and peace? And that is what ministers to your family and friends. Your fruit of peace is contagious. What about you single professionals? Single professionals, your love for your future mate should be the gift of respect, the gift of honor, that you will live in purity. You will live a godly life for each other. The gift of the fruit of love. Friends, the truth is we all need we all need the fruit of Christ's likeness in our relationships. Are you with me? By consuming what we have in our jars of life, we'll soon discover that nothing is less left and will be left dry with nothing. But you know what? By pouring out in obedience and surrender, an unlimited fountain of abundance is ours. Okay? I wonder if this still... Nothing? Okay. Let's pour in this, this water, kunyari. Okay. All poured in. And so we, we start... Wow. Oui, oui, oui. How did that happen? Okay. In the province, you stop pumping, it stops, no? <laughs> Look at that, it goes on. It's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what God does. He pours an abundance that overflows in your life. Never ending. It just keeps on going and going and going. There's a risk. The risk to this wanderer is the fact that if this parchment paper is a lie, that water would not pour forth. If, if that jar was not filled enough with enough water, he would have wasted it to try to prime the pump. Pouring the water means risking, risking. And true enough, true surrender means taking a risk. Think about it. True surrender means taking a risk. When we surrender, there is a risk for us too. It's not as dramatic, okay? But nonetheless, if we give our time to others, we give our time to others, you know what we risk? We risk our time with our family, our time to finish other projects. If we risk loving others, if we give our love, surrender our love to other people, we risk the rejection that can come to us. Yes or no? Yeah. If you surrender money sacrificially to others who are in need, you're risking the possibility of you losing money to pay for your own needs, your unexpected expenses. Surrender is a risk, though, that we, you can't afford not to take. Surrender is a risk you can't afford not to take. It's still going, huh? Let's turn it off, huh?
Okay. <laughs> you guys are so wonderful. <laughs> Surrendering is best demonstrated in obedience. You know the phrase, yes, Lord? Can you all say that? Yes, yes Lord. What that means is, yes, Lord, I will obey. That's what it means. Say no, Lord. No, okay. <laughs> no, Lord is a contradiction. Think about, think about it. How can you tell your Lord, supposedly your Lord, no? If He is your Lord, you will never say, no, Lord. It doesn't match. It doesn't match. You cannot say, no, Lord, to your Creator, who you claim to be is your Lord. Peter was a great example. The Apostle Peter, he modeled surrender when after fishing, fishing the whole night, catching nothing, Jesus seeing him the next morning and saying, Peter, cast your net on the other side. What did Peter say? In Luke chapter 5, verse 5, it says there, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. Brothers and sisters, I want you to remember these, this phrase, because you say so, I will. You see that? Lord, because you say so, I will. Surrendered people obey God's word no matter what, even if it sounds illogical, it doesn't make sense. The risks we take in surrendering are nothing but steps of faith in the promise of our God. That's what it is. This brings us back to the parable of the pump. Some of you here today are in your desert. You've been wandering around for days and months and even years. Why you're here, why someone brought you here, I don't know. But God brought you here and He's saying, are you still wandering? Are you still lost? Are you still hungering and thirsting for life? Are you living in this world with your jar, your jar that represents the things of this world. This is what we all hold. And some people are not willing to let it go. It's all they have, and yet it's so little, it's so temporal that, that they will not let it go. This symbolizes the world that we live in and all that it offers. And then you've got the parchment note. The parchment note with its instructions. Instructions representing the Word of God, God's faithful promises, His directions for living. God wants you and me to surrender in obedience to His Word so that His Holy Spirit would have all of us. You know that famous song, Let It Go? Can you all sing it? Let it go, let it go, let, let it go. Okay. <laughs> the supreme example of self-surrender is Jesus Christ. Think about it. He did not have to come here and surrender His life, but He did. As an example to us, we can't hang on to our jars of water, our worldly pleasures and desires, no matter what this world offers, because we know that it's going to run out and we'll be left with nothing. We're going to have to trust in God and His Word and pour out our lives, surrender our lives to Him. We have to risk losing it all for the sake of giving God our total obedience. But friends, let's face it. We know that God's Word is true. And because He made His promises, you and I will soon be drinking from the fountain of life, the living water of Jesus Christ that quenches our thirst forever. In John chapter 4, verse 13 and 14, He says, Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall, will give him shall never thirst. Continue. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The choice is yours. Did you learn something today? I pray that you did. Remember, hunger and thirst for righteousness. We must, number one, you and I must hunger for Christ's likeness. Love His Word. When you love His Word, you will love God and you will love others. The second is to trust for Christ, thirst in Christ's likenesses. Thirst for Christ's likeness. That means surrender your life. Give your life in obedience and you will receive the blessing of the fruit of the Spirit that you can pass on to other people. I pray that each and every one of us would stop wandering in the desert 
and come home to the Lord. Let's join our hearts in a word of prayer. Oh, Lord God, we thank you so much that in spite of our surrendering, you have so much more to give us. May each and every one of us here truly hunger for you, force feed ourselves to get into your word, to, to truly come to a point where we cannot get enough of your word. I pray that you'd put that desire in the hearts of every single one here, Father, so we may grow to love you and love others. Father, our prayer is that you allow us to live a life of true, overflowing satisfaction, that through that many lives would come to know you. Use us in a mighty way. We thank you, Lord God, for those who are here for the very first time. We thank you for bringing them here, and we pray, Lord God, that you would use this special time to speak to their hearts, to allow them to make a commitment right now. And friend, if that is you, wherever you are, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands or stand up or come forward. In the silence of your hearts between you and God right now, would you make this commitment of prayer with Him? It's up to you. But God can hear your heart. He knows your heart right now. Heavenly Father, tell Him, Heavenly Father, I've been wandering in the desert and I'm lost. I don't know which way to go and I'm getting nowhere. And I'm tired of this life of temporal pleasures. Today, Lord, right now, I hunger and thirst for you. I want to receive the true satisfaction in life that comes from you, the source of life. Father, right now, I open my heart to you, and I ask you to come in. I surrender myself, Lord God, to all that you are. I know that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for my sins. And today, Lord, I commit my life to you, and I receive that gift of forgiveness and eternal life. Today, Lord God, take my life and change it, mold it and shape it and make it all that you want it to be for your honor and for your glory. We thank you, Father, for this time and for all the messages we've heard. We thank you for Rachel and Rebecca and the song of O Wondrous Love because you are indeed the love of all. We praise you, we thank you, we honor you. We give you glory and praise. We pray all of this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen and amen. God bless you all. I love you.